Good morning, I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, a nonpartisan think tank in Philadelphia. Welcome to our event this morning. We're gonna be talking about Russia and Africa, a topic we have uh, covered in the past, but it's always interesting and it's always new. Um, here to join us this morning, we have two, um, two folks who are very familiar to most of our audience. We have uh, um, uh, hosted by um, Ambassador Charles Ray, who's a member of our Board of Trustees and the chair of our Africa program. He's also the former U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Republic of Zimbabwe. And he is joined by Sam Romani, who is an Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and a tutor of politics at the University of Oxford. Uh, but most importantly, I want to mention that uh, Sam has just written a new book, Russia in Africa, Resurgent Great Power or Bellicose Pretender. And so we'll be talking a bit, he'll be talking a bit about that as well, which is, of course, extremely relevant with what's going on on the continent right now. Uh, before I turn the reins over to um, Ambassador Ray, I'd like to thank our donors and our supporters. Uh, for, for what they do for us. Uh, we could not bring these programs to you without their support. I'm fond of saying these programs are free to you. They're not free to us. So we encourage you, if you're not yet in a donor or member category, to consider helping us out. Um, we'll also be taking your questions about midway through the program. So please put them in the Q&A box. And um, you can go ahead and start putting them in the Q&A box from the get-go. Uh, we will be looking at your questions and uh, asking our, um, our speakers this morning as many of them as time will allow. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the reins over to Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you, President Flynn, and welcome to everyone. Uh, as you, were, you just heard, uh, Sam Romney is not a, uh, an unfamiliar face to FPRI audiences. Uh, he is something of a, an expert on Russian presence in Africa and has just done a, a book that looks at Russia's presence there and, and asks the question, uh, is, this, is, is this a substantive uh, presence or, or, or is it, as, as the subject of our talk today, implies a, 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 a phantasm that uh, has very little substance behind it. Given the current actions of uh, Russia's Wagner group on the continent and in Ukraine, I think this is a very timely topic. Uh, and I would like to ask uh, Sam to tell us about uh, his book uh, and the research that went into writing that book. Over to you, sir. All right, yeah, thank you, Raleigh and Charlie, for the uh, introductions and for the context here. So uh, just to give a very brief overview of what this book covers. So the book covers Russian foreign policy and security policy in Africa from the collapse of the Soviet Union right up until the uh, September coup in uh, Burkina Faso and uh, Wagner's machinations to try to find an entry point there. So it's about 30 years of contemporary history. And uh, in some ways, it acts as a survey of this entire period, because there hasn't been a book that's been really written in English about Russian policy in Africa really since the Soviets uh, left the Durg in Ethiopia and, and Ang the Angolan War, so back at the end of the 1980s. So this kind of fills in a lot of uh, scholarly gaps, in particular the period from 1991 to 2014 is often ignored uh, quite uh, substantially. And that produces a bit of an illusion, which makes it look like Russia abandoned Africa for about a quarter century after the collapse of the Soviet Union and only made a resurgence uh, with the uh, isolation from the West, sanctions, and uh, Russia looking for new markets. So uh, just to give a very brief overview of what the book argues and what the book uh, brings to the table, I mean, number one, it argues that uh, against the thesis that Russia was disengaged and then came back. Instead, it argues that Vladimir Putin's strategy in Africa is not really even his own. It actually, in the, in the current origins of the resurgence, date back to Eugenie Primakov's tenure as foreign minister and then prime minister from 1996 to 1999, and the intellectual debates in the mid-1990s that preceded that. So uh, during the Primakov era, Russia embraced a variety of tactics. Debt forgiveness, instead of really pursuing hard currency from Soviet era debt, uh, pursuing an anti-Western foreign policy vision, which included an aversion to American unilateralism, as well as a resistance to Western sanctions. Uh, 
and also embracing Africa as a pole within the multipolar order through engaging with uh, African regional institutions like the African Union and also African countries like South Africa on uh, combating American hegemony. So an early example would have been Boris Yeltsin's meeting with Nelson Mandela about the war in Kosovo and those interactions have persisted ever since. So to understand Russian policy in Africa, we don't look just to the Putin era and to what's been happening over the past few years with Wagner. You, still, you have to go back to the mid 1990s and look at what Primakov's thinking was to really understand what's happening today. Number two, it really presents a middle ground on the question on the title question that I have over here. Uh, in, and it argues that Russia is a virtual great power in Africa. So what does that mean? Russia has all the pageantry and trappings of great power status in Africa. It hosted the 2019 Sochi summit, 43 countries and heads of state visited uh, Vladimir Putin and fed his leadership. Russia also has the legacies of Soviet era superpower status to draw upon, in particular the Soviet role in opposing decolonization and opposing apartheid in South Africa that it uses to create normative and ideational and soft power bonds with countries throughout the continent today. But the actual foundations of its material power projection is very weak in comparison to that of the Soviet Union and pales in comparison towards that of other uh, aspirant or uh, entrenched great powers on the continent. For example, its trade in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, was just $20 billion before the war in Ukraine. That's less than that of Turkey and one third that of India. And Turkey and India are not typically viewed to be uh, great powers, they're viewed to be more emerging and, and rising middle powers on the continent. In addition, uh, Russia's uh, pledges of investments, $11 billion of the Sochi summit largely went unanswered. And Russia's uh, pledges on everything ranging from uh, development assistance to the uh, provision of COVID-19 vaccines was often a small fraction of the targets that they set. So Russia is a partner that is uh, somewhat unreliable and also has got limited material capabilities, but it's got a larger than life image because of the hangover of the Soviet Union and also its uh, strategic uh, placement across the continent with military presences informally in Libya, Central African Republic, Mali, and Sudan, and also just uh, the, this broader pageantry and, sim and, and Russia being something of a symbol of anti-Westernism. So when you want to protest against the West, how better than to uh, align yourself with Moscow or have protests with Russian flags on the street? So those are two of the uh, uh, original conclusions that I came from, uh, from the book. And uh, now I'd like to open the uh, floor to more of an interactive discussion about the history of Russia's relations in Africa, as well as really what's happening right now in the current post-Ukraine war atmosphere. Thanks a lot. That's very interesting. Uh, it, you, you, uh, what you said raises a number of questions in my mind. Um, and one is, you know, post Cold War, we in the U.S. Uh, sort of went to sleep as far as Russia is concerned, and and there was really very little said or done in terms of, of looking at Russian activities uh, on the continent. I know when I was ambassador to Zimbabwe, uh, the only people who seemed concerned about the Russian presence in Zimbabwe were my intelligence people in the embassy. And that was because the Russian embassy was right behind us. And it had several dish antennas that coincidentally pointed toward the American embassy. Uh, so why do, do, do you have, it, does any of your research point to, to why the, the U.S. attention to Russia has only lately begun to, to, to revive? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think that uh, during the 1990s, the early 1990s, Russia suffered a precipitous collapse in its influence on the continent, aside from its relationship with South Africa which was uh, historically uh, very fraught because of the uh, apartheid regime's uh, alignment with the West against communism. Uh, there was a reset, obviously, under ANC leadership with the Russians. Uh, most of its partnerships on the continent really dissipated because uh, Andrew Kozarev, his foreign minister, was very reluctant and very hesitant to uh, embrace uh, anti-Western partnerships on the continent and to support uh, autocrats because he wanted to uh, not offend the, the West. Uh, Russia's partnerships with countries like Libya under Gaddafi or Omar al-Bashir in Sudan largely uh, fell apart. Russia stopped selling arms to uh, active conflict zones uh, to the same extent and was a bit more concerned about human rights than it, was, than it is today. So that's really what happened during the early 1990s. And uh, also there was an impression inside uh, the Kremlin 
particularly amongst Khazar's allies, that a lot of the Soviet era development assistance uh, measures were a poor use of resources that drained the coffers of the Soviet Union and should not be repeated. So unless there's something strategically beneficial to get out of a particular country, and that strategic benefit is very clear in terms of immediate hard currency, in terms of something transactional, there's no real point investing in countries like Ethiopia or Mozambique or other uh, client states that were done before. So there's this collapse of influence, which lasted into the 1990s and took uh, several decades to recover from, I think is what caused the West to largely turn a blind eye to uh, Russia's resurgence in Africa, even though the foundations of that resurgence were being built in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Also, Russia had a clever way of being somewhat cautious and somewhat clandestine in its tactics. So they uh, were obviously opposed to the NATO intervention in Libya, but they didn't go all out to support Gaddafi like they did with Assad. They just abstained in the UN and criticized from the sidelines. They uh, shipped arms in a rather clandestine fashion to both Ethiopia and Eritrea, to, uh, to Darfur, where to Omar al-Bashir's regime. But in Sudan, we paid more attention to what China was doing. And uh, in the Ethiopian Eritrean war, for example, the Badman war never really captured the American uh, public imagination to that, to that big an extent. So Russia was moving in theaters where America was largely disengaged or in the shadows of China. And I think that the Americans just kind of overlooked what was happening. And we really only began to see it come to the fore when Russia's uh, presence was undeniable in the form of mercenaries in strategically important countries, seizing strategically important mineral and oil resources, and uh, really displacing French influence and challenging uh, Western influence on, on areas as diverse as the Cent uh, Central Africa and the Red Sea and uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So it was really only in the past few years when the challenge became so overt and Russia's presence became so anti-Western on the continent in terms of supporting autocracies and supporting anti-Western regimes that the West really began, began to look at the bigger picture. And, and how, what do you, to what do you account Russia's change in, in, in their push of, of I mean, I, I, I know that there was this resurgence of Russian nationalism under, under Putin, but, but what caused this change in their activities in Africa that brought them, that bubbled them up to, to view and caused attention to be turned out their way? Well, I think that uh, what happened were several fold. One, I think it was a combination. Uh, very obviously, what was happening from the late 1990s into the middle of the 2010s, Russia was trying to find a way to uh, reassert itself on the continent. And uh, it had to find a way to reassert itself that played to its relatively limited toolkit and strategic advantages. Obviously, it couldn't go the route of China and investing in large infrastructure projects or large development assistance projects. It couldn't... Uh, uh, really offer a model of governance that was especially appealing, even though they did try to sell sovereign democracy and the version of illiberal uh, liberalism with a few democratic characteristics that uh, Vladislav Surkov, Putin's advisor, had tried to champion. The Chinese were able to sell their governance model much more effectively. So they didn't have the governance advantages or the economic advantages that China had. But the one area where they had a major advantage was in the security sphere, because they were the largest arms vendor to African countries. They had a brief collapse in the 1990s, but they had a resurgence in the early 2000s, peaking in around 2010, 2011. And they were selling arms to uh, strategically important countries in the continent, like Algeria, Egypt, as well as uh, uh, nemeses of the, of the West, like Sudan and, and Zimbabwe, and historical partners like Angola. So they had a continent-wide uh, presence as an arms vendor. And also, they had just militarily intervened in Syria in 2015, and uh, they yeah, gained uh, quite a bit of uh, plaudits in the, amongst autocracies for being able to turn the tide of the conflict in Assad's favor in a decisive fashion, uh, obviously with Iranian and Hezbollah and Syrian army support, but the Russians took full credit for that. And they uh, managed to uh, bring some fashion of authoritarian stability there that was done in a way that was the antithesis to what the West would do. So whereas the West would say that freedom and democracy and human rights are the gateway to combating extremism, Russia was presenting an appealing alternative model of authoritarian stability and a hands-off approach to whatever atrocities or whatever abuses were happening inside an authoritarian country. So that uh, intervention in Syria and the prestige that came from that and the model that they offered combined with their advantage in the arms sector, as well as the 20 military tactical agreements that they signed and the immediate heels of the Syrian intervention really served as a gateway to African countries inviting Russian security assistance in and that's how the mercenaries and what the Wagner group started appearing in places as far flung as Libya, Sudan, Qatar, and Mali. And uh, Russia's uh, footprint on the continent became a lot more consolidated. Interesting. Uh, a recent news report uh, that I read 
uh, says that the Wagner Group is involved in the in the Sudan conflict currently on the side of the I think this is the RSF is is that the is that the correct term? Yeah. Uh, what what do you see? I mean, how do you see that affecting uh, a, a cessation of hostilities in Sudan? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think that. Uh, Russia has always had a very malleable and flexible approach to uh, internal political dynamics inside Sudan. For example, it was a loyal supporter of Omar al-Bashir up right up until his downfall in April 2019, even after the Emiratis began looking elsewhere to generals who had uh, recruited uh, soldiers for their fights in Yemen. So Burhan and Ameti had brought RSF forces into Yemen. They were looking there, but the Russians still stayed loyal to Bashir right to the very end. And they were caught off guard, obviously, by the coup in April 2019, that uh, overthrew him. And uh, they uh, initially, uh, in their media and also from officials like Konstantin Kozyshev, who's from the Federation Council, compared the uh, coup in Sudan to the Euromaidan revolution in Ukraine, and even compared uh, Burhan to uh, Juan Guaido in Venezuela, which given the context of the events that happened a few months earlier, is probably the ultimate insult to really level at a, at a new leader, right? So to compare it to the regime in Ukraine and to, the, uh, to what happened in Venezuela with the opposition. But within five days, they normalized relations with the uh, military government. They started working with them diplomatically. And uh, the and Wagner group basically seamlessly moved from supporting Bashir to helping Burhan and Hemeti uh, repress demonstrators in Khartoum. And uh, now we're seeing that same kind of fluidity happen in the current conflict. We're seeing if Jenny Prigozhin plays a bet on the uh, RSF because he's worked with them in Libya, though they fought over there alongside Khalifa Haftar's forces. And also because Hemeti controls vital gold mines, which are important for financing his operations inside Ukraine and giving him a cut of the profits. There was an estimate from FT that showed that Prigozhin has made $250 million personally in recent times off of mineral resources in Africa. So this is a, a very beneficial for him from this point of view. And uh, it's very likely that Prigozhin was lobbying for this for quite a long time. There were leaked documents that came to my attention from uh, the Karakovsky Center that, were, that showed that the Russians were wary of Haftar in Libya, and they wanted another powerful actor there who could be more trustworthy because they saw Haftar as a US citizen, he was mercurial, he was unpredictable. So they encouraged the RSF to enter the conflict in Libya, and they uh, backed to Hemeti even from that. So that's the relationship between Prigozhin and Hemeti. But that's not shared by the rest of the Kremlin. The Russian foreign ministry has been engaging with Burhan extensively on the Red Sea base. And when I was speaking to, uh, for example, the leading Russian expert on Sudan, Sergei Sarigachev, back in 2021, he blamed Hemeti for uh, basically canceling and uh, renegotiating the, the base agreement and, uh, and delaying it. So this uh, position in Sudan looks like the Russians are backing Hemeti, maybe with surface air missile systems from CIA or Libya, but that's not proven. But that's just Prigozhin doing that. The rest of the Kremlin is hedging and backing Burhan, and they're adapting themselves very flexibly to the political circumstances that are there. So all the disagreements that we're seeing between Prigozhin and the ministries that are playing out in Ukraine in a much quieter, less high profile fashion are happening in Sudan and Africa as well. Wow. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the disagreements between the head of the Wagner Group uh, and the Kremlin on Ukraine. Uh, uh, he's threatened to pull the Wagner Group out of Bakhmut. Uh, how, does, how does that play in terms of, of his relations with the Kremlin and, and their ability. I mean, the Wagner Group, I understand, has suffered some fairly significant losses in Ukraine. How does that impact their operations on the African continent? So uh, one Russian expert told me this several months back, that there's actually not one Wagner, but there's actually two Wagners or maybe even three Wagners. So what he means is that the Wagner forces that you see in Ukraine are drastically different from the Wagner forces that you see in uh, global theaters. And there's also a distinction between the forces that were revolving mostly in terms of logistics and support roles in Syria and those who have been engaging basically really much closer to the front lines and offensives in Africa. So there's a Ukrainian Wagner and international Wagner at the very least. And there's also maybe even an Ukrainian, Syrian and African Wagner. So that's an interesting way of putting it and describing it. The Ukrainian forces that they have, have do have a small number of what they call shock troops which are uh, mercenaries who have a combat experience who are capable of conducting sophisticated sabotage operations. But they also have a large number of untrained convicts that are really uh, uh, in their use. When you're looking at the Wagner group that's in Africa, you're seeing a lot more veterans of the Chechen war, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, Syrian war, past con conflicts 
people with military training, people who can train uh, local forces in the use of air defense systems, as well as in the use of uh, sniper rifles. And, uh, and it can also work effectively with local surrogates to the point of sharing bases, like we're seeing in Mali, the Malian Armed Forces, FAMA, and uh, the Wagner Group are sharing a common base that JNAM, the rebel group, just targeted recently. So the forces in Africa are a lot more sophisticated and a lot more, uh, uh, more, more trained. So I think that it, even if they're losing a lot of convicts in Bakhmut, that doesn't necessarily mean that their influence in Africa is a whole lot weaker. What we should be more concerned about is that they're starting to lose some of those uh, shock troops and more sophisticated troops who aren't really being the ones who are being thrown to the meat grinder to the same extent. Uh, then that might weaken them a bit, but that's really what the main thing is. With respect to the situation in Bakhmut, I have a feeling that Prigozhin is really using these caustic relations with the Ministry of Defense as a form of bargaining power. He's really trying to see if he can get more munitions uh, to his unit so he can kind of claim credit for the victory in Bakhmut. I don't think he's planning to withdraw from there. If you look at some of Prigozhin's very recent statements over the past few days, he number one says that uh, Wagner is going to play an important role in the Ukrainian counter in combating the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And the second one was that Wagner will continue fighting on the offensive until the munitions come, and we're very unhappy that they're not coming. That was the response that came last night. So I think that Wagner is not going anywhere from Bakhmut, and I think that Prigozhin is already looking to bring some of his elite forces out of Ukraine on 12 to 14 month contracts to Africa, and the losses that they've suffered in Bakhmut won't necessarily weaken the group's global activities. In fact, it might lead to a, a redirection to some extent of offensive capabilities from Ukraine to Africa after Bakhmut that may even strengthen it. A question, uh, this is what you, you know, put on, put, take out your crystal ball and put on your, your, your uh, fortune teller hat. Where do you see Russian influence going in Africa in the next five to 10 years? Uh, and you know, how, will, how do you think it will evolve? So Russian influence in Africa over the next five to 10 years, that's a very interesting uh, question. I would say that uh, Russia is probably going to uh, really focus on trying to expand its uh, presence into new frontiers. I think uh, in particular, the Wagner Group is going to look towards the Gulf of Guinea because they already have a base in, uh, in Mali. They may be trying to see if they can uh, get stronger security partnerships at the very least with some countries you know, on the littoral area like Cote d'Ivoire or maybe Sierra Leone. We're already seeing Rusic, the Wagner Group's a neo-Nazi unit, strangely enough, making uh, informal diplomatic overtures on uh, the Kremlin's behalf in Sierra Leone. I think they also have the potential to really expand their influence in another region where the West is very disengaged, Central Africa. So going from CAR towards the Republic of Congo, obviously the biggest prize there would be the DRC, but uh, they've uh, had to do some machinations in, in terms of election interference and the Chinese really aren't that much of a fan of the Russians really operating there in such a strong capacity. So I don't think that they're gonna make a movement there. But the Republic of Congo is a possibility. There was just a, a conference that was organized by Alexander Dugan on multipolarity, uh, where Lavrov and others are present, and the uh, representative from Congo, from the prime minister's office, basically, to the uh, in my excitement of the crowd, said that he wanted all NATO forces to be kicked out of Africa right now. So that's an interesting uh, uh, an example of how they, they still have some soft power and some movements. And in general, I think they'll try to entrench their presences around mineral resources that we're seeing in Sudan and Libya, the oil and the gold, respectively. And uh, that's what I see from the security standpoint. From the economic standpoint, I really see them uh, basically trying to expand their trade volumes wherever they can. There's been expansion of trade with Egypt, which is positive. Obviously, South Africa is continuing to engage with Russia, and they're looking to new projects there. They, they burnt their bridge on nuclear energy, but maybe liquefied natural gas might present an opportunity. So they're going to look for uh, projects, particularly uh, in areas that are not directly affected by secondary sanctions. So they may have difficulty selling arms across the continent, aside from areas where they have a security presence or from countries that are already sanctioned. But in terms of energy and in terms of uh, other uh, non-defense related goods, I think they're going to look towards the big powers and try to expand their uh, commercial dealings. Interesting. You, you mentioned China and Russia, and, and, and that brings up a, a question of you know, the Chinese are, well, I guess the Russians are seen as China's junior partner uh, in terms of Chinese support or lack of condemnation of what they're doing in Ukraine. Uh, but is, is there a potential for Chinese Russian um, disagreement, if you will, over Russia expanding its economic footprint on the continent? 
Yeah, well, I think that uh, one of the things that we, I noticed when I was looking at my book also was I traced out Chinese scholarship on Russia, really from uh, the middle of the 2000s on to the present day. And what I noticed is that China never had any illusions about Russia's resurgence or about Russian influence and always had a very clear eyed view of its limited capabilities. For example, when Dmitry Medvedev was on tour to four African countries in 2009, and the West was seeing this as a bit of a brief resurgent moment, uh, the Chinese uh, media and also Chinese academic journals are talking about uh, racism in, in, in Africa and racism towards African students and, uh, and how Russia is a xenophobic country that will never really be embraced by the uh, new generation. During the Sochi summit, there were a lot of discussions about how Russia's uh, uh, mercenary and informal security uh, backed uh, power projection uh, presence is not something we would ever want to copy and also not something that will be wholly effective. The Wagner Group's uh, forays into Mozambique, which ended into a, a disaster, were being mocked in the Chinese media as well as them walking into a rainforest and, and uh, suffering high casualties with no guidance. So China has always had a very clear-eyed and view of Russia's limitations on the continent. They're really aware that Russia's bark appears to be worse than its bite. And also they're alarmed by the fact that Russia is exacerbating governance, bad governance situations across the continent and not doing very much to improve uh, counterterrorism situations or counterinsurgency situations, especially in the Sahel. Uh, and uh, that uh, means that China needs to invest more in their own private security companies to prevent what just happened in Central African Republic where nine nationals died. And they have to invest in diplomacy to uh, kind of uh, really counter and ameliorate the uh, exacerbating effects on bad governance that Russia is bringing. So China, I think, views uh, Russia not really as a credible partner in Africa because they're aware of its limitations. And in some cases where, the, where, where Wagner is involved, they may actually view it as a bit of a nuisance and a bit of an inconvenience and a thorn in their side. Um, though in the United Nations on issues like voting against uh, Western sanctions uh, and on uh, voting to defend autocratic regimes from criticism, like uh, Ethiopia during the Tigrayan War or Sudan after the Khartoum massacre in 2019, there they have common ground. So outside of multilateral institutions, the picture is not very pretty, but inside the United Nations, they look very, uh, very harmonious and they look a lot like the No Limits Partnership that we see Xi and Putin talk about all the time. Uh, but, okay, what I hear you saying is that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors here too. Uh, yeah. In the, uh, I was thinking of, of another issue that, that came up uh, that I'd like your comments on. And, and that's, we recently did a, a panel discussion on the joint China-Russia-South African naval exercise and, and something that unfortunately really didn't get brought out, but I'd like your comments on it if you think about it. The, the, the Russians, uh, well, the Soviet Union was a strong supporter of the ANC during the apartheid regime. Uh, and, and, and many of, uh, it was pointed out that many of the, the South African naval officers trained were trained by, by Russians. Uh, but when you look deeper, you find that they, they actually were trained in Ukraine and, and have, have ties to Ukrainian military. Uh, and, but South Africa is, say, siding with the Russians on this whole Ukraine issue, but, but uh, you know, remaining neutral and, and not doing anything to aggravate Russia. Uh, how do you see you know, that? working out i mean you have these you have these quote soviet ties but when you look at during the cold war i mean a lot of the a lot of the training and support was actually from the soviet republics not not russia itself and you know how was how russia squaring that circle uh it, when when they approach these countries that's actually a very fascinating point. So I was just in South Africa in late March and I had a chance to engage with officials and experts and as well as people of different generations who are affiliated with the ANC and uh, opposition parties. So I got a pretty much a panoramic view in a short period of time of what the uh, different views on the Russian uh, Ukrainian situation are. And I found that, you know, in the, within the ANC and particularly within the ANC's more radical wings, like the Julius Malima Youth League, I mean, there's a bit of a division between the uh, older generation and the uh, younger generation. So a lot of the older generation is very much inclined to never use the words invasion or aggression or call it a Ukraine-Russia war or call it some kind of a NATO uh, aggression against Russia or a NATO-Russia proxy war. Those narratives are really prevalent. And there's a lot of nostalgia and enthusiasm for the Soviet Union's role in uh, imposing apartheid and that rolls on to make to, to just Russia as a successor state. Amongst younger generations, among some of the opposition parties, and even within, I think, bodies like Durko, uh, 
whereas the defense ministry is more pro-Russian, Durko and some of the more public diplomacy wings are a little more uh, cautious, a little more nuanced. You get the impression that they really see Russia as a very different state from the Soviet Union. They see it as an ultra-conservative, xenophobic, uh, uh, racist country that's really not nothing to do with being friends with anybody in uh, in Africa, let alone Black South Africans. And uh, and and they really kind of are taking more of a of a balanced approach on the issue, but they don't want to uh, burn their bridges with Russia because they don't want to. Uh, uh, really burn their bridges with any major power. They want to play all the major powers off each other to see what they can get. They want to have a situational, non-aligned foreign policy. So inside South Africa, there's an element of the older ANC leadership and some members of the Malima Alliance, as well as I would say in the South African Ministry of Defense, that's like really looking at the Soviet Union and Russia as interchangeable. And there's others who really question this. And, and for it, not, the reasons you stated, interestingly, about the other republics didn't come up, but I can imagine that being added to the reasons why they would want to take a more nuanced position on the conflict. And that's what South Africa's position over on this war really shows. It really straddles both of these boundaries. There is the Operation Mosi drills in the Indian Ocean, which kind of show solidarity with, uh, with, with, with Russia. There's allegations even from the United States that could put the partnership under review, that there's been even some small arms movements through South African ships that haven't been uh, detected. But then there's this uh, kind of neutrality that Russia's, uh, South Africa is also trying to promote from a sponsoring a humanitarian aid resolution that doesn't blame Russia and the United Nations to offering to mediate, uh, to uh, even, uh, yeah, the, and then the opposition parties uh, really calling for Putin's arrest in the ICC and the South African government hedging on that question to the point in which I don't think Putin is probably even going to come. So that is, uh, that is an interesting balance inside South Africa. There's really two South African foreign policies towards Russia, but the one that's more pro-Russian seems to be getting a lot more of the public attention and seems to be winning out because those are the people who at least uh, before 2024 and before the next election cycle are the people who are currently wielding the most power. Interesting. Well, that, that's that's very interesting. And, and I noticed in our Q&A box, we already have several questions piling up. And so I'd like to uh, turn it over to Raleigh to moderate the questions from our audience. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Ray, and thank you, Sam. Really interesting discussion. We have a lot of questions in here, some of which you, you've, you've touched on and, and some of which you've actually answered. But uh, we have one that uh, asks, what is your take on the joint naval exercise between Russia, China, and South Africa? And I would add that we did an event on this not too long ago, and if if I know Sam's going to give a great answer, but if you want more, you can find the video of that event on our YouTube channel. And I encourage you to watch it. Sam? Yeah, so just building on what I was just saying about South Africa's uh, position, I would say that those drills were really fairly uh, routine in some respects because in, in Russia, China, and India have all been working together on Indian Ocean security quite often, engaging uh, together on those issues, trying to basically create a front against uh, the uh, the West, and also that even extends even to Red Sea security, the security of the Babel Mandip Strait, all those frontiers seem to be linked together in the maritime sphere. And uh, South Africa, obviously, being in, in, in the Indian Ocean, having a stake in that security zone would, and being part of BRICS, would want to join those sorts of drills. So we're seeing Russia, China, and Iran cooperating in that region, and we're also seeing Russia, China, and South Africa cooperating in that region, and also some movements between Russia and India and uh, even Russia, China, and India the odd time. So that's really uh, where, where I see it to be. Of course, the timing of it, uh, given the uh, current war in Ukraine, and given a lot of the suspicions about South Africa's potential violations of sanctions and South Africa's like uh, faux neutrality, uh, uh, veiled pro-Russian stance on this conflict, uh, really uh, created a lot of anger and a lot of animosity in the United States and drew much more attention than, let's say, the nuclear-capable bomber jet that flew into the into the Sochi summit in 2019 uh, that Russia brought in for the first time in Africa. That didn't get anywhere near the kind of reaction this got. So I think that we uh, we Operation Mosi obviously is a clear show that Russia's that South Africa's got a multipolar security policy, and in many ways, it's that the South African Defense Ministry is looking east instead of looking west. But we shouldn't read so much into it as some kind of an unprecedented display of solidarity with Russia. It actually, it really fits in with broader trend lines in South African foreign policy that we've seen under both Jacob Zuma and Sarah Ramaphosa's tenors as president. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, I also see we've just posted a link to uh, the YouTube video of the um, event we did on uh, the, um, the uh, naval exercise. 
asks for some kind of informal agreement Russia and China about their respective influence and economic interests in the various countries in China. How do they coordinate what they're doing? Yeah, that's an interesting question because obviously the coordination is happening, happening below the surface. There's really very little in terms of Russian and Chinese interactions about uh, uh, African issues, either economic or security. There's one uh, Russia-China uh, economic slash investment forum that's usually held in around November and December. The last time it was held was December 2021. Uh, that did deal with uh, uh, Africa-related issues, but that's a mo relatively minor conference where you're looking more at like at the highest levels of representation, deputy foreign ministers and lower, not like the uh, highest and most senior officials coming to that. So yeah, it's uh, there's really not much above the above the ground that we can really see about Russia and China's economic interests. I suspect, however, that uh, obviously the Russians and Chinese likely communicate about the impact of Wagner and if they're creating instability or exacerbating governance in areas where the BRI wants more stability, making sure that there's no uh, deconfliction. I also found out from my research uh, on the situation in Mozambique that when the Wagner group entered Mozambique, they were trying to get a cut of the natural gas resources in Cabo Delgado, which is very similar to what they were trying to do with gold and diamonds in Central African Republic or oil in Libya to finance their operations. And they reached out to a variety of international stakeholders, including China, basically offering to provide security by fighting ISIS in Mozambique to the Chinese in exchange for a cut of any potential Chinese gas concessions there. But China didn't want to get into that kind of uh, security for economic barter relationship with Russia. So that tells you that there's clearly defined limits and red lines of where China is willing to engage with Russia in the economic sphere. And uh, also the uh, Chinese uh, are, are a bit concerned about uh, Russia's uh, like uh, destabilizing activities and don't really view Russia as a very advantageous economic partner. Russia has uh, managed to get that picture of that and recognize that, even if it doesn't admit that in public, and has tried to capitalize on any kind of discontent with China to try to present itself as something of a hedge partner. So in countries where China's uh, de debt trap diplomacy accusations are, are at the highest, Russia tries to present itself as a champion of debt forgiveness, talking about the $20 billion in debt that it forgave from 1999 to 2019. And they're still forgiving debt in places. They just did it in Guinea-Bissau, for example. And then the Guinea-Bissau legislative body at the parliamentary conference in Russia and Africa praised Putin's leadership to the skies, right? That's an example. Another area would be in Zimbabwe, where they were, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, uh, where Russians were investing in Darwindale, a little bit in a way, at least from Russian media sources, trying to present themselves as a bit of a hedge partner to the overwhelming dominance of China. Another could be the Democratic Republic of Congo, when the Chinese got a little bit cold feet about Joseph Kabila and some of the personalistic tendencies were concerned about violence in the elections, the Russians try to step in and uh, invest in, in cobalt mining and try to present themselves and with a vote of confidence in the current administration. But these are all like around the edges, relatively minor gestures of discontent. So Russia is neither a, a competitor to China, nor is it really a partner. It kind of lies somewhere along this competitive partnership continuum. And that, that's where I think it's going to stay. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, uh, uh, a listener says, I've heard that African exchange students studying in Russia have increased over the years. Is this an indication that Russia has stepped up their long-term political influence plans? So yeah, Russia likes to vaunt the fact that its number of students have indeed increased. And there's been a lot of programs that do promote that. Rosatom, for example, the Nuclear Energy Agency is very active in training uh, or trying to train uh, engineers and uh, people in the uh, hard sciences and uh, tactical fields to come to Russia and come to Russian institutes and universities. And this is a carryover, obviously, of the Soviet era development assistance and educational diplomacy that was quite successful in bolstering uh, Soviet soft power, as well as the appeal of socialism uh, inside Africa during the Cold War. So uh, that those uh, things are ongoing, and we're seeing uh, friendly gestures like you know the renaming of Patrice Lumumba University back to Patrice Lumumba, right? Like. Uh, way for the Friendship University to kind of harken back to those Soviet legacies uh, as well. But uh, again, it's a very small uh, number of people in, in still in macro level terms who are going from Africa to Russia to train. It's part of a broader uh, internationalization trend in uh, African students going elsewhere. There's also African students going to Eastern European countries as well, as well as in larger numbers uh, going to, to China and other Eastern powers. So it's not really uh, something that's really the success of Russian public diplomacy per se, it's more the fact that there's a youth bulge and like an emerging uh, 
middle class in some countries and some of those students are looking to go abroad and Russia is familiar to them and their parents and because of the Soviet legacies. So they decide to go there. So we shouldn't read too much into Russian educational diplomacy, even though they advertise it a lot. And it's a very, very good positive arm of Rosatom because Rosatom gets accused of price gouging, autocracy in the case of South Africa with Zuma and the whole scandal with the Gupta family and uh, bad environmental practices. So having a good educational program is kind of a good way to kind of uh, put a humanitarian face on it and shield some of those uh, bad aspects of the nuclear energy deals that come with them. Um, just to um, take this from another angle, uh, is the United States still a popular destination for students as a rule in, in Africa? And how do we compare to Russia and some of these other countries? So uh, one of the big myths of uh, America, about American foreign policy in Africa, and I'm actually working now on my uh, third book, which actually deals with U.S. foreign policy in Africa since the end of the Cold War, and really traces, you know, some of the uh, mistakes that America has made in terms of grand strategy, as well as some of the advantages that America may not be tapping fully into, is that American soft power in Africa has really waned and decreased dramatically uh, because of its disengagement from the continent and because of uh, some, some ill-timed uh, policies and rhetoric coming from uh, various administrations. Uh, and in actual fact, uh, American soft power in Africa is actually alive and well. Favorability ratings of America on the continent range between 60 and 70 percent in most countries, comparable or even in excess of that of China, uh, whereas Russia's uh, hover around 30 to 40 percent. And with the Ukraine war, those numbers are going down further. And the more that Russia seems to engage on the continent, the more unpopular it seems to become at the popular level, even if it's popular amongst autocrats and, and some uh, social media influencers and some uh, uh, illiberal or, or like anti-Western civil society organizations. Also, America is a uh, much more appealing as in terms of its governance model, as well as an educational destination, absolutely. So we should be uh, not underestimating American soft power. The problem is maybe America has not harnessed the soft power appropriately, but the appeal of the American governance model, the American economic system, American education system is uh, still very strong and much stronger than what Russia can offer and arguably stronger in many cases than what, what China can even bring to the table. Uh, can you um, uh, focus on that just a little bit more? Uh, U.S. policies in Africa, what, what have we done? What could we do better? So, uh, I mean, there's a variety of things that I think can uh, come to the table. I mean, I think that in terms of the, uh, well, if you're looking specifically at great power competition and how that might impact, you know, the future of Russian influence, I think that, number one, there should be uh, more of a critical examination of where the U.S. is engaged on the continent where it's disengaged, because it's disengaged, for example, quite substantially from the conflicts and issues related to Central Africa. And that has allowed Russia to really step in and get to the advantage. When I speak to the Central African Republic officials who are very close to Chihuahua, they frame the uh, the intervention as uh, or of Russia as an exercise of Central African sovereignty against French neocolonialism. As soon as you step outside that, and you talk to lawmakers, security consultants, those who live in the uh, closer to the Lake Chad region than Bangui, they realize that Wagner has captured the state, there's, bag there's uh, buyer's remorse, there's atrocities that are happening that uh, the CAR army now has to own. And if America were to step in and America were to be more involved, they don't like France, but if America were to be more involved uh, and, and be able to liberate or extra extricate them from this, or any other power would be able to do it, they'd be pretty happy to do that. But the problem is it just isn't enough interest and just isn't enough strategic commitment. This is a special envoy to the Horn of Africa, this is a special envoy to Libya now, but not really a major redirection or a major pivot on dealing with Central African issues and the mining rich countries that are there where Russia is really capitalizing on its advantages. Another area is a tendency to, uh, which builds into this, a tendency to uh, rely on being after, behind the curve and trying to chase Russia instead of trying to preempt Russia. So the number one way to uh, deal with the Wagner Group, deal with some of its pernicious influences is, is probably preemption in the Gulf of Guinea and in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Central Africa, not just preemption in a, in a military security and sanctions threat sense, but preemption in terms of the uh, information warfare, in terms of the uh, narrative warfare too, because Russia is selling a myth of its influence. It's selling the myth of itself as, a, as this kind of a very powerful uh, security provider and it doesn't interfere in internal affairs, it's invited by government as opposed to colonialism, that's, a, that's kind of a willing to kind of right the wrongs of the past. 
And uh, America does not really uh, respond to that and those narratives effectively or in a very delayed fashion. So Russian narratives get first mover advantage and it becomes very hard to change people's mindsets after the fact. So I think that uh, cutting things like, you know, Voice of America and cutting public diplomacy and really did cutting, making a problematic budget cuts that relate to soft power uh, in favor of just a hard power and uh, a military counterterrorism focused presence that we've seen so often has been a bit problematic. Also, making being, being a bit reckless or being a bit cautious uh, with the being more cautious with the sanctions regimes and how they're uh, implemented. Because if they're targeting elites and targeting individuals that it, they, it, for and punishing them for 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 war crimes, punishing them for authoritarian abuses, that's one thing. But creating no incentives to escape from them, and also uh, being applying them carte blanche well, without updating them, without revising them, without working on them, creates a lot of rooms for criticism. So I think a smarter sanctions policy, a more proactive information warfare, a focus on uh, preemption instead of uh, just following uh, the curve, and also uh, really looking where you're engaged and where you're disengaged, and don't disengage in regions where which have strategic importance and also where uh, Russia and others are just uh, ripe and coming in. There's no response. Um, Ambassador Ray, would you like to um, comment on this as well, given given your experience on the continent? I, I totally agree with with what Sam said, uh, particularly about the uh, what I what I actually called when I was ambassador there the indiscriminate use of sanctions or or the fire and forget use of sanctions uh, because uh, we we basically shoot ourselves in the foot when we we react to something by by applying sanctions without without making sure that they are specifically and surgically targeted and that they are preceded and accompanied by a narrative that fully explains them. When I was ambassador to Zimbabwe, I spent an inordinate amount of my time explaining to Zimbabweans what our sanctions regime, regime really meant uh, to try and counter the, the propaganda. And I had to basically do it on my own because it was very difficult to get the bureaucrats in Washington uh, to pay attention. I mean, they, they imposed the sanctions and they had other things to do. And, you know, I, I discovered when I arrived, for example, that we had, we were sanctioning dead people. I mean, we had a sanctions list and we hadn't reviewed it in there. There were people who had been dead five or six years who were still on the sanctions list. Uh, we were sanctioning one individual who had been a government official but who had broken with the with Mugabe, for example, and formed his own opposition uh, political organization and was more vocal against the excesses of Mugabe's government than the opposition party that we were supporting. But he was still on the sanctions list. And, and you know, as 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 Sam said, this this made it very difficult for, for the embassy on the ground. And it made it very difficult for US foreign policy because you know, they, could, they could come out with a news report that says the US is sanctioning X and X is anti-Mugabe. What, what, you know, how does this make sense? It's pretty hard to answer that type of criticism. Uh, and, and also I, I totally agree with what he said about being preemptive. I mean instead of waiting to see what the other guy's going to do and then trying to respond to it uh, I, i'm there there needs to be a an assessment of where our interests are and then to be proactive in going in and doing the things necessary to support those interests to give a credible alternative to russia and china rather than making it well we'll see what russia will do we'll see what china will do and then we'll come in and we'll Will will offer something. I think we need to be the first salesman ringing a doorbell if we want to make a if we want to close the deal. Uh, thank you, um, Sam. You spent a lot of time. You've spent a lot of time studying the continent and uh, and in researching your book. Was there anything that um, did you have any preconceptions that were overturned or anything that surprised you as as you did the research and were writing this? Yeah, well, there were several things that were kind of quite interesting. One of them was just uh, like in, in looking at the concept of Russia and Africa, which is like uh, how uh, much the Russian foreign policy in Africa was quite intertwined with the broader foreign policy developments that were happening 
uh, like, you know, the changes from your know, Kaiser to Primakov and Russia-West relations and just like the longevity of this resurgence and how then it just sped up more recently. Because I really didn't, wasn't really aware myself of the 1990s and 2000s being so important because there was no journal articles, no book chapters, nothing written about it. And then I was kind of telling the story for the first time by doing interviews and by looking at uh, Russian media sources from the time, as well as, uh, you know, uh, also looking at academic journals uh, in Russia and other things to trace this all together. That was one thing that was quite interesting. And then another thing that was also uh, quite interesting as well was, I think, uh, in some ways, just the endurance and just the ability for Russia to almost uh, sell, its, sell its case and sell its narratives with uh, even though the uh, track record is quite uh, so far, far short of them, how it's still able to expand, how it's still able to move with that. I mean, that was really quite uh, an interesting and an eye-opening thing uh, too, to see just uh, how, how nimble and effective and uh, they are in terms of actually, you know, selling their case with the limited resources that they have. So that was kind of, those are two of the things that kind of uh, jumped out at me, like as being quite interesting. And also the decision-making processes as well. I mean, I really came to the conclusion that, you know, at least in the earlier days, a lot of the ideas of Russian power production in Africa came from below within the government, from the Federation Council, from advisors, from the Institute of African Studies, intellectual debates, uh, state-owned companies. It wasn't just this Putin-centric power vertical that we often see. Uh, it's so drastically different from the rigid command structure and the secrecy that we see in Ukraine, for example. So there's there's like a couple of different variations of Russian foreign policy. And after the, the African engagement strategy is fundamentally different from the strategy in the post-Soviet space. So that's, those are just a few things that kind of jumped out to me is quite interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, we have a, a few more questions. One, uh, Russia, specifically the Wagner Group, has scored some successes in the Sahel region, such as Mali and Burkina Faso. What strategic value do they see in that region? And is Chad next? So they see a number of things in that region. Number one, they obviously want to get access to mineral reserves when they can get there. So they want to get access to the gold and uranium reserves that Mali has. And uh, Burkina Faso, they're already trying to negotiate the control of a mine. Number two, obviously, they want to uh, capitalize and displace uh, where because the French are disengaged uh, increasingly from at least from Mali with Operation Barkhane drawing down. There was a transition to Europeanization. There were all these coups that threatened Western influence. Russia saw a vacuum and, and jumped in. So it's just a way of thumbing their nose at the West and also uh, reasserting themselves as a continent wide grade power and showing that they are, have influence uh, that's, that's growing somewhere. I mean, I think that it really it counters the narrative, particularly with their failures in Ukraine, that their power that's uh, declining and it's depleted. So even when they were suffering from manpower mobilization struggles inside Ukraine before the conscription began, they actually increased their Wagner presence in Mali from 500 to 1,000. So they increased their presence of, of highly qualified elite troops in Mali, right as they were struggling with so many elite losses in Ukraine. That gives you an example of how the optics and the image of them projecting influence somewhere, being on the expansion and being on the rise somewhere is really quite important from a psychological perspective. But the prospects for longer term expansion of influence, I think, are a bit overstated. I think in Burkina Faso, there's growing evidence that Traore, uh, he doesn't want to cut the Russians off because he's got figures uh, inside his uh, cabinet, including maybe even his, his second in command, who have been uh, who are close to the Russians. And he's fearful of another coup because Demiba, his predecessor, promised in some ways informally to engage with the Russians reportedly. He didn't follow through, and then he ended up having a coup. But Traore also wants to maintain close ties with the West. And he realized that following Mali and accepting Wagner is the best way to completely lose the West in the longer term. So he wants to become one of the uh, good autocrats that the West kind of aligns with in terms of blind eye to. And we're aligning with Russia is kind of the worst way to, uh, uh, to, to, to not become that. So the, and also further afield, the prospects are really limited. I mean, the Americans and the French are too in Scots and Niger. Uh, and in Chad, the Russians have a gambit to probably train the fact rebels who was assassinated to be against his son, Mohammed to be. And uh, they have training uh, history in Libya but they don't seem to be like a force that's powerful enough and the depth of Russia's linkages are too ambiguous to really suggest that they'll have a sphere of influence there anytime soon. And Chad in its current form is very strongly opposed to Russian influence in both Central African Republic and in Mali. And is one of the few African countries that regularly votes against Russia in the United Nations and publicly criticizes Russian conduct in West Africa. So they obviously want to stay relevant. They want to show that they're a rising power. They want mineral resources, but their ability to actually extend beyond Mali to Burkina, let alone Chad or Niger, is very, very ambiguous and very unlikely. 
Uh, we have another question uh, asking, how effective are Russian propaganda, misinformation, and disinformation campaigns in Africa? And I would add, can you talk specifically about what they're doing now? So uh, Russian media obviously is expanding its presence in Africa. And part of it is, be, is an extension of the uh, Ukraine war because RT and Sputnik obviously have lost their bureaus in uh, Europe and the United States, but there's still a lot of people on their payroll. They still view, and Russia still views those two organizations as integral organizations for their national security and for their administrative uh, functions. So where are those people going? So some of those people are going to South Africa. RT is opening up an expanded bureau there. Others from Sputnik are going to the Francophone uh, African branches. So they're expanding their presence in Tunisia, which has always been the hub into West Africa. So there, there's a lot more Russian media presence. Add the fact that there's also been Western diplomats who've been expelled. And those diplomats are not all diplomats. A lot of them are intelligence agents. Those people are going to be relocated and redeployed to global South leaders. So African embassies are likely to take them in. So there's a political technologist, a, a intelligence wing, and a media wing that's working and coordinating at the same time, right when Britain and America and uh, are seeing their, their budgets for these me international media outlets being cut. China is supporting the narratives that Russia is pushing on the continent, and France is being thrown out by countries that are hostile to French. Look at RFI going in Mali and in Burkina Faso back to back. So Russia has got a significant uh, advantage just in terms of presence in the media war. Also, it's been quite effective on the use of social media, like RT Arabic in Egypt and Sudan, and many other countries actually at times competes with or even outstrips Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, uh, particularly amongst the 18 to 30 generation who are active on YouTube. So that's another advantage. And uh, the Russians are also getting around and being more evasive of uh, censorship and also uh, restrictions from the big tech companies. So instead of relying on bot farms and troll farms, they can easily be uh, cracked down on as a violation of terms of service. They're actually hiring real people uh, through uh, who are surrogates who promote anti-Western narratives and say that Russia is a, a, a version to neocolonialism and invent uh, things like, you know, the Gossi massacre that the French uh, fictitiously perpetrated right in the same day when the Russians perpetrated, perpetrated an actual massacre in Mura. And uh, de denying these things and cracking down on this becomes, if it's real people, becomes an issue of freedom of speech, not an issue of uh, violation of terms of service. So the Russians are able to manipulate and use Western tech companies to their advantage also to expand their presence and their, their media presence. So it's a mixture of expanded media presence and access, the resonance of, of certain narratives, and just them being very clever in adapting to this kind of uh, post-Ukraine war, uh, more limited, what we think is a more limited information environment in the West, turning into a bigger one in the non-West. Interesting. Um, another quick question. Russian officials are eyeing a port of excuse me, Russian officials are eyeing the port of Berbera as a location for their base on the coast of Somaliland. I guess that's a question. Are they eyeing Berbera? Um, I think that they're not eyeing Berbera anymore. I mean, that was uh, an outdated uh, report really from 2018. And even the United Arab Emirates wanted a uh, base in Berbera, but now they've moved that to much more of a civilian facility. So in general, I think there's a divestment from uh, external powers from Berbera and Somaliland's coast as being uh, extremely uh, significant. And that's, uh, th that, that is applying towards Russia. Russia obviously wants the Red Sea base to be held in Port Sudan, but as I said earlier, Hemeti has been a bit volatile and it seems as if uh, Burhan also is waiting until there's a Sudanese civilian government or Sudanese parliament or to ratify it. That might not happen. So now increasingly, the Russian telegram channels are starting to sometimes talk about Eritrea as a possible location. And given Eritrea as a uh, a very poor relationship with the West, uh, which may have been eased somewhat by the ending of the Tigray War, but I have a feeling with the current crisis in Sudan, Eritrea is going to be back being a spoiler in the region, and they're going to find themselves isolated again even more, and Russia might just uh, take the bait the next time. Uh, we have, we're out of time, but we have one more quick question, and uh, the writer says, I know this is hard to generalize, but what are the levels of use of the Russian, the Chinese, and the English language in Africa? So obviously English is, uh, is predominant of those three and as well as French, but Chinese uh, language education is expanding and Russian is expanding to a much slower extent. The only place where Russian language is really gaining a major foothold in the longer term is Central African Republic, where now it's kind of a quasi official language alongside French and uh, university students, even some upper secondary school students are basically being compelled to learn it. So uh, linguistically, uh, the English language has got an overwhelming advantage and Russian is the weakest of those three.
Okay, thank you. Um, we are out of time. Uh, so um, if we didn't get to your questions, I'm very sorry. Um, but I think we covered a lot of them in the general talk itself. So thank you to Sam and thank you to Ambassador Ray. Um, and a thank you to our audience again for your support. Uh, please visit us online, www.fpri.org. And um, this video will be posted afterwards if you want to rewatch it. Thanks. Thank you.